You're listening to Graphic Novel Explorers Club Podcast, an audio book club. Ho, 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 Explorers. I'm one of your hosts, Johnny, joined by... Dennis, the ghost of Christmas present. <laughs> and... Aubrey Zavallis, the ghost of Christmas horror. <laughs> today we are discussing krampus by writer brian joins and artist dean Kotz. we hope you've read today's title because all three of us have read the book so beware holiday spoilers ahead graphic novel explorers club is available wherever fine podcasts are found including the north pole so be sure to leave a review and subscribe wherever you listen to the show that's right. Today we're looking at Krampus, written by Brian Jones. I keep wanting to say John, like my tongue wants to say <laughs> Jones. It's Jones, J O I N E S. Illustrated by Dean Kotz, K O T Z. So it might be Coates. Published by Image Comics in 2014. And we're re- reading the trade, the first volume, which covers issues one through five. The uh, comic actually ends on a sort of a, a teaser for whatever comes after this have the have they written or published the second half i don't think i've seen anything but it's also a a maybe i mean it it was kind of a teaser in case they wanted to continue the story i don't think it was a definitive continuation which is good don't paint yourself in a corner (laughs) yeah (laughs) well before we get into this i wanted to give a quick shout out to some of our listeners in different cities um so we're recording this actually about a month and a half before it goes up because we plan ahead. We've gotten some like new cities that we don't normally get listeners from. So, and they've actually been listening a lot. Do you want to hear the international or the domestic first? International. Let's go- yeah. International. international. We've got in Belgium, Mechelen and Brussels. I'm probably butchering the pronunciation of those names. In Germany, we've got Kernock and Rimpar. Oh, they're going to love then- this episode. <laughs> oh yeah, that's true. This, this is a very European centric comic. And then up in Ontario, Canada, we've got Canada. uh <laughs> I dated, <That> foreign nation. <laughs> I dated this girl years ago. That's how she would always say is Canada. You know, Canadians are from Canada. In Kitchener and Brampton, Ontario. And then in London, United Kingdom, we've got Ilford and Pimlico. Those those cities have all been listening to the podcast quite a bit. So uh, thank you for that. Domestically, in the United States, we've got uh, Newport, Kentucky, Houston, Texas, especially Newport. Newport, Kentucky has been, someone's been listening to us on uh, Pandora quite a bit. So whoever's listening in Newport, Kentucky, thank you. Houston, Texas, Dayton, Ohio, Cincinnati, Ohio, and Memphis, Tennessee. They've been listening to the podcast a lot. Well, thanks for listening. Although it is, the technology is slightly creepy where... We we know exactly what app you're listening to us on. I, know, I, know. I, I find that a little disconcerting. Yes, we uh, know that you're listening to us on your 19 uh, or 2011 iPod. <laughs> <laughs> Crazily enough, it tells half of these listeners. It tells me I've been listening on the toilet. So that's, uh, <laughs> that's even more disturbing. <laughs> and we can hear back. By the way, that's yeah. a two way. This is a two way. Oh, Audio. Some, so wherever you're listening, we can hear yeah. you too. Hey, some of you Dennis. really need to. Some of you really need to eat more greens. I'm telling you right now. You guys, you gotta knock it off. You heard about what happened with the void the noid, right? No. Really, you haven't. Uh, Avoid the noid, okay. like the old From Domino's the, Pizza thing. Yeah, you don't know about this. No. There was a guy that thought his last name was Noid, and so he thought the Noid was talking to him and that they were like making fun of him. So he tried to kill some Domino's people. Like he went to a a restaurant and held them hostage. Oh my gosh. In the eighties. Oh, but still, okay. I I see what you're saying. The the commercial was talking to him. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. We're going to get held hostage. Stop listening to me on the toilet. (laughs) Well, you can find me at the milk farm. I'm right near the sign. Come and get yeah. it, buddy. <laughs> Out in Vacaville. Vacaville, California. Dennis is frequently known to hang out at the milk farm sign. Just don't tell the FBI that because they'll yeah. connect the dots. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so this this comic is about Krampus. It's I don't know. It's a fun story. It's about uh, the theft of St. Nicholas's bones, which is where a lot of the, I guess, legend or myth of Santa Claus has come from. All these Santa Clauses. These bones get stolen from Italy, which I guess they're really housed, his remains or 
what's attributed to be his remains are really in Italy, in this little town in Italy. And if the bones aren't recovered, it will mean the demise of every Santa Claus that's in the secret society of Santa Claus. That includes Kanaka Koloka. I'm saying that terribly. I'm sorry. That's the Hawaiian version of Santa Claus. There's Father Christmas, Old St. Nick, Santa Claus, which is, I believe, um, Norwegian. And uh, then there's tons of others. And with the bones missing, the Santas return to their only remaining option, and that is to release Krampus from his decades-long imprisonment to recover the bones of St. Nicholas. Along the way, they find there's a conspiracy and multiple parties at play in trying to bring about the end of the Santas. And to keep Krampus in line, the Santas strap a naughty bomb on his chest. So if he does anything naughty, it'll explode and kill him. Yeah, a little bit of uh, Escape from New York. Yeah, that's what I thought, too. (laughs) I was like, oh, Snake Plissken and uh, Krampus have uh, some beef in common here. And yeah, I mean, I looked up a few of those. Obviously, they did their homework, but those are all legit versions of Santa Claus. It was interesting to me because I did look up the Japanese one because I was thinking, why aren't there any, like, ethnic-looking Santa Clauses? They're all white dudes. But, you know, even in Japan, they're not religious there. And so it's just a commercial holiday for them. And in fact, the way they celebrate Christmas in Japan is by eating KFC. That's their, <laughs> their that, that's no joke. That's their, like, what they consider, a, like, a Christmas meal. And so their Santa Claus, whatever his name was, I forgot. He's the one who, lo- he, lo- he doesn't look like that normally, only in this comic that I've seen that. But he's the one who was in the business suit, who looked all yeah. modern. And so he's the Japanese one. And they're all just generally just, you know, well, it's, you know, a white Christian holiday. So we're just going to adopt the stereotypical image. Well, at one point in this, towards the end of the comic, when the bad guy is close to winning, he does talk about like how half the Santas in the world are or whatever culture's version of a gift giving God or godlike being. Almost all cultures have those so like half of them are in tropical environments. But who you're talking about is Hoti Osho which is a Buddhist god monk. He's not related. He doesn't have anything to do with Christmas, but he was a a god monk that carried a sack and would give gifts to children or was kind to children. But he had had eyeballs in the back of his head to allow him (laughs) to see when people were being naughty. uh, Santa, the original police state. Hote Osho. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, so there's lots of Santas in here. In fact, the what spoiler who turns out to be the bad guy, Moss Grilla was actually based on when the Russians came in and took over um, Romania? Romania in the late 40s. They already had the the Romans Romanians already had uh, their own sort of Christmas tradition, but it was very Christian based. So they came in and like. <laughs> Within three years, got rid of all of that, made it illegal to celebrate, and introduced Moss Grilla, Gorilla, who was a more of a communist, sympathetic, gift-giving Santa who towed the communist propaganda line. And that's who they were allowed to celebrate. So yeah, I thought that was pretty funny. Hell yeah. And I, and I will say that this comic has one of my jams, which is a association of multi-dimensional or, or, or similar types of heroes. So in the in the Marvel universe, there's the Council of Reeds, which is a whole bunch of Reed Richards who from the different multiverses who hang oh. out together. There's also a Council of Kangs, a Council of Dooms, and they all just <laughs> hang out together. And then it's usually they're always in the same room and you see like different variations. And so I really dug the secret society of Santas. Yeah, me too. I love that. Aubrey, you picked this book out. What what was the uh what what jumped out at you? Oh, really? It's just that I'm not a fan of Christmas and all the traditional shit that goes with it. Which really, when you say traditional, it's not. It's the traditions mostly came from paganism and then was contorted and adapted by Christians to try to, you know, get more converts and warp more people <laughs> over to their side. So it's all just so complicated and then for america it's just about capitalism and consumerism and there's just not a lot of joy and magic in it for me anymore so i sort of lean away from traditional christmas stuff so when you said we needed a a holiday comic 
the first thing I thought of was, I wonder if there's anything about Krampus, because Krampus is just <laughs> a really fun concept to me. And I love the movie that came out in 2015 mm. about Krampus. It's a comedy horror, and it's super funny. So I Googled it, and sure enough, I saw this one, and I loved the art style. And I could tell that it was also a comedy horror, which I'm here for, so... If it's going to be about Christmas, I want it to be a comedy <laughs> horror. <laughs> yeah, of the, of the books that we've read that are holiday related or Christmas related, they're all, they're almost always Santa's involved somehow, and they're all pretty gruesome or weird or like it's like the authors are all happy to fuck with the Christmas tradition. Like I don't know, I really I've really enjoyed all of the. Well, in one way or another, I enjoy these holiday books. We we tend to, you know, we read every year around the holidays. I get a kick out of them. Yeah, I would agree. Uh, in fact, it's funny. I I'll say that I really love Christmas. I have like a ton of MP3s of Christmas music, that sort of stuff. <laughs> like I, I have Christmas a lot. Music. I have like every version. <laughs> if you, if you want a Hawaiian Christmas, you want surf rock Christmas, you want classical, you want heavy metal. I have it all. But anyway, it's fascinating to me how many at least the European countries have these weird, dark, pagan, like winter rituals, like, especially like Sweden and all that. Some of this stuff looks like it's ripped out of Midsummer. Uh, <laughs> it's just really bizarre with like goat masks and all sorts of interesting things. And it, it's really fascinating to me. So it's 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 rife for, for the plucking in terms of getting some interesting material. But yeah, I love Krampus. I love, I love the whole idea of Krampus. I love that movie. There's a great Aquabats, if anyone's an Aquabat fan, a great Aquabats episode involving Krampus. I, d I love the idea of Krampus completely. I just forget that Aquabats had a TV show for a while. <laughs> oh, I have not forgotten. <laughs> <laughs> there's just so much rich holiday lore, or I should say, like, there's so much winter lore across mm -hmm. the world. And I'm biased, but from my perspective, I feel like Santa... Santa Claus in America is one of the most boring ones. But then again, I grew up with him. But I love learning about other countries, winter holiday mythology. And that's what's super fun about this book is it's it's actually adapting and bringing a bunch of those into the same secret society of Santas. And I do like that one of the Santas does call out the America Santa mm -hmm. for being like a glutton, essentially. <laughs> it's like, yeah. all you think about is food. <laughs> Pretty soon you're going to be putting a type 2 diabetes in stockings or something like that. <laughs> America well, like, called out. Yeah, it's like, it's like our our culture is so new compared to every other culture in the world. We are and our and our Santa is not really based upon anything other than buying people Coke, presents. Coca-Cola. Um, yeah. That's what I was thinking exactly. Yeah. So yeah, all these other ones, it's 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 like we're just so ingrained to Disneyfy things. So like all the European Santas, yeah, there's always some dark like I was I was reading about all these Santas from these different cultures and a lot of them have these like creepy sidekicks who manipulate things and they're always like scary monsters who like go in and if the kid's bad, they'll take their gifts or they punish them somehow or and then ours is like, well, he leaves a coal he leaves a lump of coal in your stocking if you're not nice. He doesn't murder your family or, or you know, and, and his sidekicks are these little elves who make toys up in his workshop. So it's like the real little mermaid right. she dies and turns into sea foam at the end. Yeah. Whereas in the American cleaned up Disney version, she gets her man and they get married and she stays, you know, married and becomes a princess. Yeah. So only her soul dies in that one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> her her independence and soul. Right. I will say what fascinates me, you know, like I said, I have lots of Christmas music. What fascinates me is that there's like this, they don't actually call it this subgenre, but I, I nickname it this. I call it the subgenre of Christmas music, Horny Christmas. There's a <laughs> lot of Christmas songs where it's like about getting busy with someone. You know, there's, you know, Santa Baby, where she's trying to F Santa Claus. Uh, you know, of course, uh, you know, baby, it's cold outside. I saw mommy kissing Santa Claus. There's just a lot of horny Christmas stuff that's going on. <laughs> oh, it's a real horny Christmas. Also, um, I will say, just on a tangent, one last thing about Christmas music. It's very hard to create, uh, Mariah Carey aside maybe, 
new Christmas music that like becomes timeless. Like most of the time, everyone is covering something that was done in the 40s and 50s and like nothing else. <laughs> and it's kind of weird. I mean, I like that stuff. And like I said, I collect different versions of it. But it's fascinating to me, like how every time someone tries to come up with a, a new Christmas song, either it's just like, who, what? Or it becomes Mariah Carey's one hit. And then it's like for all eternity, that becomes a Christmas song and it becomes part of the regular uh, playlist. <laughs> I think it makes sense that they're all covers from that time because I feel like that's when the American Christmas that we we grew up with was invented, really, because earlier American Christmases was very simple and it wasn't about buying bullshit. It was about like making a corn husk doll and I don't know, it was just another winter day where you like eat with your family and i think that it changed a lot with with like coca-cola and the just rampant consumerism and um capitalism that was designed to boost the economy after world war ii i think that's where we got like the modern christmas no absolutely you're correct and that also brings to mind the other subgenre of christmas music i like which is <laughs> i'm really de i'm really depressed and i want to off myself oh, but God. it's christmas what? time it's a wonderful well, life yeah. it's a well look i'll be home for christmas i mean that guy is really i envision him like on a bridge ready to <laughs> jump off <laughs> a lot of christmas oh, or the classic john lennon Christmas, you know, Christmas time war is over. I mean, a lot of those are really depressing. It's like, oh, That's I hope you I... enjoy your your presents while other children in the world are dying. <laughs> <laughs> Merry Christmas. I was like, wow. Wait a... And then when they play that on the Christmas stations, I was like, That's not really jolly. Do you really want to hear this while you're shopping for gifts at Macy's? <laughs> I can't anyway. stand Christmas music. The only oh, I love it. The only two <laughs> Christmas songs I somewhat like our blue blue christmas by elvis and uh rocking around the christmas tree but whatever that song title this is the only two i can tolerate the only one i like is the hawaiian one malakaliki oh yeah yeah does anyone I know how to say that it. okay i don't well, know how to say everyone knows what I, I don't mean. know what you're talking about yes that's the only one i like no that's a that's amazing and used in the uh national lampoon's christmas vacation during the pool scene yes oh. <laughs> yeah very good but yeah i love christmas music in fact you will find me playing it the day of Thanksgiving. Like, I cannot wait to Canceled. play it. I just, I just play it 24 7. I don't care. I'm the guy who likes to listen to this station. But conversely, I also love, love Halloween. So I cannot wait for when Halloween rolls around, which is why Nightmare Before Christmas is like the melding of both my, my uh, favorite holidays. It's just you <laughs> and uh, ecstasy coma. Uh, Pretty much. Uh, <laughs> That's exactly me. <laughs> Pumpkin spice lattes in one hand and hot cocoa in the other. <laughs> Get it. Well, getting back to the comic, um, because we went way, way, way. Well, off enough for a Christmas here. talk. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Throughout the story, you wind up running into all these different characters. I had, I, th I thought it was really funny. Like the sugar plum fairies are actually these like little demonic fairies that do the bidding of this mysterious, the mysterious figure behind all mm -hmm. the stuff and. Doc Holiday winds up <laughs> showing was, up. That was so good. <laughs> so funny. When, when he showed up, I was like, oh, no, you can't be serious. Like, at first I was like, he's not even related to a holiday, which is gets actually explained. Yeah. But it's like, it just happens to be that his last name, which isn't even spelled like the holiday, is Holiday. So how did yeah. he get embroiled in this? But I thought it was brilliant as well. Yeah, it's so funny. I, I cringed a little bit. And then as the story moved on, I was like, all right, I'm in. Yeah, I'm in, and I like too at the beginning of the story where Joins Brian Joins is uh, explaining that this book probably ruined any chances of his ever writing for Wolverine. I thought that was really funny, <laughs> uh, like his sense of humor and, and like this is the culmination of his sense of humor and because of stuff like this is why he'll never get to write for Wolverine. But By the way, he did write a bunch of Bill and Ted books, and I could see that kind of humor kind of oh, coming for through. sure yeah totally. now that you're saying that i definitely see it yeah i guess they did two big reissues of the collections i saw something with evan dorkin on his on his website about there's like two collected volumes i think of the bill and ted's comics from the 90s excellent so definitely we just read uh <laughs> that was uh, episode 83 we did on um, a nice one <laughs> we we need we need to do the little box that they put in the comics, Johnny. Uh, 
asterisk C oh. episode. Yeah, that's not a bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, and, and how the bad guy reveals himself, I thought was you know was a good twist and turn. I didn't see it coming. I didn't know really who was going to be the bad guy in this. Uh, well, and it made me I honestly look him up. You already explained who he is, but it made me do a Wikipedia search, which funny enough, the Wikipedia picture for him is from like some propaganda poster. And it actually shows a young man like shedding some sort of old man mask. So it's like literally this, the panels in the comic are from that propaganda poster. Oh, wow. That's awesome. But wait, that guy, Mos, what's his name? Mos, Mos Gorilla. Most yeah. gorilla. But he wasn't True. actually, he was a puppet. He wasn't actually the puppet master of the whole. True. Right. Yeah. At and first the, you think it, he is the, the puppet master, but then it's revealed later. Yeah. yeah. It's, uh, we'll, we'll just go ahead and say, because we did a, a spoiler disclaimer at the very beginning as we do in every episode. It's Frosty the Snowman. I thought that was hilarious. I'm like, <laughs> yeah. all right, how's, how's the benevolent Frosty the Snowman? How, what's his, what are his motivations in this? <laughs> yeah, it's just it's like such a fun book because it's called Krampus. So you think it's going to be about Krampus, but Krampus is really just the like pilot that's navigating you through this conglomerate world of all winter, ta- like all winter folklore of all from all these different cultures. And it's just super fun. He's the gumshoe. He's the right. You know, the, yeah. uh, the detective that's in over his head. And I definitely, you know, we haven't spoken enough about this or at all about this, but the artwork is fantastic. I love the design for Krampus, very detailed. Shout out to every design of the different Santa Clauses. They're very distinct. You know, you would yeah. think old man with a white beard, they're all going to look the same, but they don't. It, uh, they, they have their own flavor to them. It was, it, it felt really good uh, just looking at all the different, different designs and stuff. Yeah, one of the things I really appreciated about that they did in this book you don't see this enough in comics where both the writer and the and the artist gave shout outs to the team the creative team because there was the colorist and the and the um letterer the letterer thanks as many comic books as you as we read you think <laughs> i would know the job title uh, but they just they both celebrated the creative team that helped them bring this comic book to life which i i wish more comic book creators did uh um, yeah there's, it, you know, there's more than just the two of them to get a comic book out. So, For sure. And it, I mean, I as, really cool. as we've probably seen before, I mean, even the colorist, I mean, they can add a lot to just simple black and white images that aren't really there. But, you know, a good colorist will definitely bring life to uh, the drawings themselves. And yeah, the just, you know, how the pages are composed, the illustrations. I love Krampus's design so much. It just, if, if, it was really great. I I love when they do drawings of like he's like a demon esque creature. I love this type of drawing. They do it every once in a while with Batman in his cow. Some artists do this where their nose meets their brow. It doesn't dip in. It just like extends out and over. It's more mm-hmm. animalistic. Mm-hmm. Uh, I really like that. that. Yeah, I love the characters designs in the series. And then at the end, I love that they did the little identification of the different Santa Clauses. Because yeah. I honestly, I, I'm i actually more interested in reading up about the different lore and how they vary and, you know, how they interact with the different cultures they're from. I also like how Krampus at the end tells you how, because it's a trade book, there's here's all these quote unquote bonuses to pad out to reach the uh, ma- minimum uh, numbers <laughs> for, or number of pages for the for the book. So. Yeah, I loved the that page at the end that lists all the Santa Clauses and where they're from, and or even not necessarily Santa Claus, but just some kind of winter lore right. figure. And it really showed something that you could feel throughout the book was that, which is that it was just super well researched. Like they really put like love and care into making what's a really just silly, goofy, outlandish book, but they still approached it with like this level of care and respect but without shoving it in your face because right. it's still just like they lightly touch on these little like in jokes and little information about each of these different mythological characters but in a way that isn't shoving it in your face and like expositioning too much but still gives you the sense that they really looked into this and for sure i mean even the people he's questioning i mean jack frost father winter and all that stuff it's all it's all hilarious to see that play out i also liked the uh political struggle that was happening within the uh the secret society of santa claus between um father nicholas and old saint nick or something like that uh yeah how they were that the power of struggle within i was like oh that's a nice touch too 
they're because they're, they're, you always think of Santa's this like jolly old man, and it's like no, these guys are a lot of them were assholes jockeying for power within their society. I thought that was, and, a nice and you know, and to be honest, you know, we've read uh, a few different Christmas stories, like you said, Johnny. And, you know, they all, like you said, they, they've tried to do a modern spin, make it ultra violent. And I felt this was a unique enough story that it didn't seem the same. You know, it's very easy to make Santa Claus, okay, we're going to have Santa Claus that curses, is going to, you know, butcher people or whatever. But this was a unique angle, uh, especially coming from the Krampus side, but having the society that it didn't seem like retreading of of the same thing, even though it's so easy to fall into that trap of, okay, we're just going to have a boot stomping Santa Claus who has a machine gun or something. But, it, you know, he was able to create a very unique lane for himself. Yeah. And I feel like the one that you're describing is it's kind of like a cheap, easy way to sort of get laughs because it's just like, oh, just make Santa say F-bombs. And right. yeah, it's, yeah. it's yeah. funny because it's breaking the norms of what we're used to seeing with this character and this character is supposed to be, you know, wholesome and jolly. And so it's funny right. to just like throw them into this other zone, but it's already been done a bunch of times and it's, it's not funny enough to like hold and propel a whole story. This story didn't do that at all. It was more like making actually fleshed out characters in a fleshed out universe. Yeah. This, the story is, I'd say closer to like the big Lebowski than, um, oh, yeah. than like a, than like a holiday story. Cause it's, <laughs> it's, yeah, it's just him constantly trying to figure out what's going on and yeah it was good it was a good thread i definitely want to i want to read hopefully it'll be out before next year when we do our 2022 uh holiday special i i would love to see how this story wraps up in in the next volume so hopefully you shouldn't say happen. that man we're still waiting for archie horror the <laughs> well, that's true. Uh, everything i love is monsters i mean we keep yeah. saying oh i can't wait for the next volume and then it never happens yeah it never happens, so. <laughs> Such is life. Such <laughs> is life. But uh, what, what do you guys think? Recommend it? Yes. <laughs> I highly recommend <laughs> it. <laughs> it's, a, it's just a super fun story with, with fun characters. And it's not too like violent or bloody or anything like that. Even for Krampus is a very dark character in the actual German folklore. Like it's pretty, really disturbing. Because mm -hmm. a lot of those folktales, Krampus and the other ones that we were mentioning were designed to keep kids safe. So they were designed to keep them from wandering out of their bed at night and getting kidnapped and murdered or getting eaten by a wolf and, and stuff like that. So the tales can often be very dark because they needed to keep those kids safe inside. Yeah. But this is definitely a more fun take on it. And it's dark, but it just like skates that edge of, of he, still keeping it quite light. He does throw a kid off of the, a bridge <laughs> at the end of the <laughs> he, th that kid probably didn't die in my head cannon <laughs> <laughs> in your head cannon <laughs> he just got a little wet <laughs> and immediately swam over to the shore <laughs> yeah i highly recommend it i actually found it funny the beginning the foreword of the book where krampus is talking about the book and he says, you, maybe you got this as a gift from grandma because she knows you like comic books. <laughs> and hopefully, <laughs> hopefully she kept the gift receipt or something like that. Yeah. Uh, th this is definitely just like Aubrey said. It's actually honestly not that violent. I mean, it is violent, but yeah. it isn't like some of the other Christmas books we've seen. There's not a lot of gore or anything like that. Maybe the dead body that they find in there is the most gory, but it's what you would find in a zombie comic. Nothing too bad. But I, I found it very compelling, interesting. The usage of Krampus is great. And I honestly, much like uh, I talked about earlier, I think it's a great gateway to open up someone's eyes that, hey, it's not just about American Santa Claus. There's a ton of other, you know, different winter folklore that you could possibly explore and, and look into. And yeah, Krampus is my favorite. So it's great to see him highlighted. Well, uh, thanks for listening, everyone. We're going to be back in just a few weeks with season six of the podcast. So thanks for sticking through our, our downtime. We always take uh, the end of the summer and the fall off. Behind the scenes, we're recording episodes and getting the next season prepared. So, um, yeah, we'll be back in just a few weeks with a brand new season of the podcast. So thanks for listening. And uh, if people want to follow you guys on social medias, where can they do that? You can follow me at Mixtape Majesty on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. Gene Explorers on Twitter and Insta. Oh, and Aubrey's got uh, her podcast, which oh, yes. is... Oh, yeah. Uh, give a little shout out about that, too. 
Yeah, I also have a podcast that is about movies. It's called Bring Your Own Popcorn. Finally got a Twitter going for that. So you can also follow Bring Popcorn on Twitter or Bring Your Own Popcorn on Instagram. And we are planning to do a crossover episode at some point with Johnny and Dennis. So look forward to that. Yeah, it's a fun one. Go give it a listen. So. Also, Aubrey, right. just as a uh, a question, if we go on TikTok, does that mean Johnny and I have to learn to dance? <laughs> um, <laughs> yes, but only because I say so. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, <laughs> look for that, explorers. <laughs> <laughs> or, yeah, we're going to drive drive people away from TikTok. It was fine until uh, Dennis and Johnny got on there. And until the boomers got there. It just uh, dropped. We're not boomers. Get well, that's what, <laughs> honestly, G- Gen Z calls anything that's older boomers. They call millennials boomers. So that's no. that's their term. Well, but, if, uh, <laughs> if you have a boomer attitude, like boomer is not actually an age, it's a state of mind. It's a state of mind. Yeah. <laughs> well, I want, I I want a booming attitude. <laughs> Okay, Boomer. I'm, I'm Gen X in my brain, but I'm Boomer in my heart. Oh, no. <laughs> Cancel. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks for listening. Uh, we'll be back in just a few weeks with the sixth season of the podcast. Bye. 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 Bye.